Thank you very much. All right, so we're here. At, this is a sort of a community board. Whatever we have, there's a community board too. <laughs> Of Brooklyn. Uh, thank you very much for coming. All uh, right, now we'll start off first with the Julian Hill. We'll start off with the Julian Hill. Yeah, we'll start off with the Julian Hill. So we're going to do this right now. We're going to start off with here the Swayne Bird Street. Uh, it's supposed to be the area. Two, you know, numbers 220188DMK and 228182RK, CQR, CQR, 220DCP149K. Uh, basically, this is for the zoning changes at block 388, plus 1, 8, 9, uh, 11, 12, 19, 31, 34, to 38, 41, 42, uh, 51, 52. And it's a, uh, basically a change from an M12 to an R7B uh, with an R. Yeah, and also in along Third Avenue at T42. And it says text amendment also for uh, Appendix F. Uh, and also, yeah. yeah. So basically, what it is going to be a, a, a large scale building of mostly residential units, but also commercial units. Along the Third Avenue side, as well as on Bergen Street, um, and let's see, yeah, okay, and it's uh, we have yes, well, it's almost uh, it's, yeah, it's, well, several thousand, hundred thousand, uh, you know, square feet of space that will be used for the Mississippi you know, Pacific property, uh, and it will be yes. 9,480 square feet also on the commercial side. Uh, and it'll be a number of, of affordable housing units uh, for this particular property. Uh, okay, so I'll ask whoever is that's the main presenter for 280 Bergen Street to come forward and start your presentation. Yeah. Okay, and you should make sure that you know. Meaning this is all being recorded. And uh, what we will do is that if the hearing will just go through. Uh, we will take people who are testifying after the presentation uh, of the of this presentation. Those who have a from the public who wish to testify, the testify will give you a couple of minutes. And then at that point, after the testimony, the hearing will be concluded. So I guess you'll be the one to start off. Thank you. Your name is. My name is Dave Siegel. Um, and I'm the attorney for the applicant. I'm a, I am a shareholder in the firm of Greenberg Trials. We first, very good to be here. This is my first community board meeting in two years. And it's good to be out of the house. You're closer. You can hear me. I said, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> okay, so before we start the presentation, let me introduce the, the team. 
Um, over on the left is Rich Dillon. He's the representative of the owner of the property, Milano. Uh, Dan Eggers is my colleague. Uh, Nancy Dude is from VHC, the environmental consultant. David West is from Hill West. And, and um, Anthony McConty is, the, is from the union that has worked at a lot of premises for many years. Okay, so I'm going to step back. We'll start the visual. Okay, so first we're giving you an overview. This is the block that we're talking about. It's the block immediately to the north of White Cross Garden. Um, we'll explain some of the details when we have a little better close up. But you, the board has seen this block before. It's been part of it in an application that Eric Palat made in January. Big day. So this is the block again. As you heard Colton say, this is zone M12. If you look at the area, this is the manufacturing block in the middle of the red section. And it got that grade deliberately by a predecessor of the owner. In 1961, when the zoning resolution was enacted, this block was residential like all the other blocks. But there had been some manufacturing buildings on it since the early 20s. And in 1971, the predecessor to the model wanted to. Band. So, at their request, the block was rezoned to manufacturing to accommodate their building. And now, as you hear soon, uh, for reasons, Alano is going to relocate its business and we're looking to change the zone. Okay. This is a block that you have seen before. This is looking at it from over here um, on third. And Bergen, looking across the street. This is the gas station that you've seen before. And this is the one that was built in both of the buildings over here. Now, for a bird's eye view, so you can see the whole block. Again, this is the gas station site that you looked at in January and approved the zoning for it. Yellow is Alano's property, it's 50,700 feet, square feet. Now, the purple are lots that Alano has leased from HPD to use for parking. They total about 19,000 feet, and they're pursuant to leases that are another 40, 41 years to run. Um, we're not proposing any development on those lots. Okay, again, now that you've seen the overview, again, this is the view from across the street. Now, for a close up of Alano's building. These are the buildings on Burger Street with two stories and one story. This is on Wycross. These are townhouses that exist now that do not part of their property. This is the open area to the west of the townhouses on the slide. And this is the 67 foot development site over here on Wycross. This is the HBD 11,000 foot lot over here on Medicine and Wycross. And this is the other HPD, about 7,500 square feet or so, that is the other one. Okay, so now to refresh your recollection, uh, back in January, the gas station proposed a rezoning to change the M12 to an R7D, which is 5.6 FAR, and with a C24 commercial overlay. This board approved it. 
city planning approved it, and right now it's before the city council. Uh, we're proposing exactly the same thing that they proposed with an 100 feet of burger. And if there gets approved by the council, then that's because that's not part of our application anymore because it's effectuated. But we, we independently started this and we're finishing it uh, just in case it doesn't get approved by the council members. We certainly hope that does. Okay. So, having, having explained uh, the background and told you we're proposing the rezoning, and we told you we're proposing it because Milano is going to relocate, which deal with the representative Milano to explain why. And then I'll be back to discuss the zoning we proposed. Richard. Thank you for having us here. Uh, I'm uh, a real estate fellow, uh, so I've been uh, helping Milano uh, in this process. Uh, as you know, as the director of this engagement, it's a very thorough uh, process. But first of all, uh, you may want to know about the Milano business. The current owner acquired this property I think 19, I think 1999 they acquired this property. Uh, they had an operation of long-standing nature in Germany. They had an operation that was about 10 years old outside Houston, and along with all those refineries and other places that are unpleasant. Uh, and then they acquired a competitor in Milano and have run it for the last 20 plus years. They make a dye or a solution or an emulsion that you use in the screen printing business. Uh, that dye, when placed over a mesh, uh, will make a depression on a piece of fabric or other items. Uh, think about a t shirt or any number of things in which that's, that's used. Uh, the business is greatly affected by uh, digital printing, and that's negatively affected by. Those technologies, those technologies have replaced or, or put very deep uh, competitive pressure on many of the old uh, systems. Uh, in addition, uh, Jay mentioned the building uh, in which they operate. It was from the 1920s, and I know it had been a brewery, it had been a, a distributorship for a board and milk company. Those of us uh, years ago who had milk delivered to our front stoop came from a place like this. Uh, and uh, since the 70s, it was this operation for the predecessor owner and now current. Uh, it has low ceilings, it has a lot of columns, very big columns. It doesn't lend itself well to manufacturing. And in particular, it doesn't lend itself because of the residential neighborhood to manufacturing other than eight to four every day. So as a consequence, it is a very inefficient and you have to add very high cost production. That's not a personnel issue. That's just the, the difficulty of dealing with an old facility that's been trying to adapt to this program. The net result is for the last five years, the owners have lost millions each year, and they made a decision to consolidate uh, the lines of business, some back in Germany, uh, majority in Houston, and some uh, are not quite finalized, but likely in Minnesota. In a third party operation where they would buy time from this business. Uh, that operation and that, uh, uh, that those decisions have been long in the works. They've been discussed with the union and we'll hear back from or we'll hear what the, uh, the governing union uh, body has to say about that. And uh, the personnel have gone from 10 years ago in total about 100 uh, to now 28. Union composition uh, has gone over the last three or four years from 30 down to about 10. And it's anticipated that uh, the operation will close by the end of this calendar year. A number of people have been invited to transfer to Houston. One has taken it up on it. Uh, seven people so far are uh, becoming independent contractors or 1099s. Uh, uh, and there will be a test. 
anticipated there would be two or three handy people involved in maintaining and operating that facility or maintaining that facility or safeguarding that facility until such time as a replacement could be put on there. So, Bobby, you have a question? Okay, well, thank you. Uh, I'd like to introduce Mr. Anthony. Hey, hello, everyone. My name is Anthony Randy, and I'm the vice president of Local 22, and we belong with the Eastern States Joint Board. We have represented the Yamaha Corporation for many years, I believe, going back to 1996. Yolanda has always been a friend of labor. We were always able to collectively bargain with them and get uh, very good contracts for the men and women that work there. Um, all of our members had uh, wonderful benefits. They have a very nice uh, severance package. And Yolano has just lived up to uh, their expectations that were set out for them in the contract. Even as they downsized, they did it right. They did it by seniority. And they are still living up to their expectations with paying the members benefits uh, right up to the end. So yes, we they are sorry to see them go. Uh, they have offered members positions if they would want them to relocate. The ones who haven't, the union has done our part to uh, offer them jobs elsewhere. The rest of it is just me, the project. Got it. Okay. Okay. So, as I said, this is the zoning that was proposed in January that you approved in R17 of the C24. We're doing the exact same thing. Essentially, the rest of the block is now an M12. We want to make it an R7A, except for this portion, which is townhouse, but R6B, we're not touching that. An R7A has 4.6 FAR, has a max height of 95 feet, setback at 75 feet. Okay. This is, this is a, a rendering of what the building will look like. We'll share with Donna Metrics in a minute. This is the building on Bergen. Next. Another view of it. Next. This is the building on my court. Okay. All right. The exonometric. Looking at it at Bergen. This is, the, this is uh, what it would look like. A 95 foot high building max. This is the portion that goes closer. It's the same size uh, as the rest of the building. The portion that goes to the R7D. About 238. Thousand feet together with these other two buildings, other than these three buildings, two townhouses, and a small and nine story building, they provide about 300 units. Okay, next. It's just the view of the other side. Again, this is the building that you saw before it was approved um, for the gas station site. This is our building on the other side. Again, Whitecourt Garden, the building on Whitecourt, and two townhouses. Okay, this is the first floor plan. This is the commercial we talked about, about 5,000 square feet in the only air park that's zoned for C24. This is a community facility about 5,000 feet. The parking is behind the buildings, enclosed, the stackers, a total of 125 parking, 110 of which is required by the zoning. 
These again, these are the two townhouses on the right corner of the other building. Okay, so this is MIH, but you know, of course, the map is MIH, it's been acquired. When we started this, we were talking about option two. Catch up, so. This is much better. Okay. So we started talking about option two, which would be 30% of the 300 units, 90, 90 units. Those are the current AMI schedules. Those are the max annual incomes and the max rents. This is option one. Based on the fact that all this was intended not just to look at MIH, but to ash 421A, everybody knows that 421A, as we now know, it expires today. And at least the talk is that it gets renewed uh, in some form in January. It's more likely to look like this with lower AMI. That's it. That's our proposal. Well, you know, ultimately, as you know better than I do, it's the council member who chooses. And uh, we have not heard the council member's decision on that. We've been talking about this. And my guess is that whoever does any affordable is going to match whatever the new 421 a is. Nobody should be doing option two if the state is providing a rent abatement that's based on doing 60% AMI. Everybody should be looking to the state, including us, for what to do. Okay. I caught up? Okay. All right, great. Now, at this point of the hearing, um, we will allow people who are not coming for a speaker from the public to have a couple minutes. I already, I already heard from the union, and thank you very much for your uh, contribution. Uh, any other folks from the public that wish to speak for two minutes regarding this? You wish to speak about this matter and you're not okay. Come forward, you give us your name, please. Thank you, Doctor. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, how's it going? Uh, my name is George Romero. I live in Fort Peck, State Street, uh, in this here. And uh, I'm lucky enough to be here because there is a lot, uh, there was housing for me. Uh, and uh, during the, as we saw during COVID-19, a lot of people moved out of the house and I was able to negotiate out, out of the work and I was able to negotiate better rent. So more supply uh, leads to cheaper housing, which leads to more neighbors and for me to be part of this community that wouldn't have been possible without having housing. So I am really in forward for this uh, project and I ask for even more housing so that we can have more neighbors and uh, more people can live here with affordability. So I would recommend uh, to vote yes and to have more housing. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any others? Yes, come forward. We have two minutes. My name is Howard Poland. Oh, yeah. 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 It's only seen my eyes for a while. Uh, I'm president of the Borum Hill Association. So I I want to comment on this proposal and also say that the Borum Hill Association represents the neighborhood that goes all the way to Fourth Avenue, from Court to Fourth, from Skirmel Horn to um, Warren and Wyckoff. So this is an interesting proposal, but we think it needs a lot of work. Uh, in earlier on, in reference to 98 Third Avenue, the Borm Hill Association supported that proposal because the developer worked very hard, even though that we did not, that was not the zoning we would normally approve, but the design as presented. From his own line, went was across the street and did a good job to match that in height, bulk, and material, materiality. In the page we saw earlier where that schematic of that building, one thing we object to is that this is a mid-block building and it is taller than 98 Third Street. This is not the usual 
MO with instruction, usually it's lower. So our first reaction was we could do a designation there that is six stories. You only have to go across the street to Third Avenue to look between third and fourth to see what that looks like. For the land use committee, I'm going to point out there's a two-story building across the street. There's the taxi depot on the other side of Third Avenue. Whatever we do here and approve this, we're not a fan of nine stories. We also think on the one on the White Club side, the residents there deserve their view plane and to maintain a plane. So R6 B across the entire street there, not just the two fillings. But again, a six-story building on the on the broader lot is not a bad idea. Then lastly, nine stories is not necessarily out of the picture. This is a transit-rich environment right near public housing. It'd be great to get some of the residents out of Wyckoff and Warren houses into brand new housing if they qualify. So nine stories is not out of the question. It's not what we want, but if you said there was deep, deep affordability, not what's on this slide behind me, if you said you get 30 or 40 percent, that's a conversation worth having. I represent a lot of people who live in gentrified homes. Our neighbors are in these public housing projects. And on this kind of thing, this is where we want to engage. The other thing that makes me angry is everything about this proposal looks south or west, right across the street on Nevin Street is the extension of the Boren Hill Historic District, which we went did a lot of work to protect the low-rise neighborhood. But there are many things this neighborhood needs. I think I've got to stop there. I'm just going to make an editorial that A.D. Flatbush is a project we fought. But again, what's contextual, what's important is preserving a neighborhood and adding appropriately. This proposal needs some work to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the public who wish to speak? Please give us your name and if you have an opinion. Right. Uh, hi, my name is Ojas Sate. I'm uh, I live in Fort Greene on Myrtle Avenue. I don't have an affiliation. Um, I'm a I'm a big housing proponent. I I I I'm I'm not from a association, but I I, I didn't think that was um, necessarily the truth. I I I know housing growth is much slower than job growth. Um, you want kids from New York to be you know able to house LGBT. Youth and Ukrainian refugees, and you want people to be able to house, uh, be housed in New York. And and three additional floors is three additional floors of renters, and, and I'm a renter, and I like that. Um, I have one question. Uh, can I ask questions here? Just speak. Okay. Yeah, I, I, just my one question is that it's it, it sounded like there's a 110 minimum parking um, limit. I'm just wondering why you're extending it to 125. Given it's so close to Barclays, it's so close, it's a transit strict environment. I just want to know what the additional parking is for. That's it. Okay, thank you. Are there any other folks from the public? Hearing none, it's a, oh, look, somebody? Yes. So I lived here for 49 years. My name is Sanaya Nauman, S-A-N-A-Y-I-A. My last name is Nauman, N as in Liz, A-U-M as in Mary, A-N-N. And I have quite a few concerns. Don't go away with the bike. So I'm not knocking the bike, but I see the people using Myrtle Avenue as a bike lane. It's not big enough for a bike lane. That's number one. Number two, I have a concern that someone got killed on June 2nd. On the corner, on the sidewalk, the moped, rider, on Clifton Place, and the corner of Classic Avenue. Okay, okay. understand that we were talking about the specific housing you have. I mean, this is not a general. Okay, so we're dealing with the housing. But in terms of that. Just this proposal, that's the only thing we're opening and discussing. Okay, so in terms of the housing, I mean, do the people have the jobs to be able to afford it? Because who's going to serve the rich people in this community? That's it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'll just make a point. Is there anyone else who wishes to comment specifically and only on this project at 280 Bird Street? That's all we're dealing with right now, part of the hearing. Just want to make sure before I say, that the hearing is now concluded. Thank you.
Okay. Now we're going to go into the Landmarks Land Use Committee meeting for Community Board 2. Again, uh, I have thank you to Kevin Johnson for helping me take notes. And thank you also to my co chair, Dawson Kershaw. <clears throat> Hmm? Oh, uh, oh, yes, okay. Well, what I'll do is I'll just do the uh, preliminary before we actually get into the uh, next one. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we have a, a list of, I don't know if many people have seen the agenda. If there's, been no, if there's no objection, we'd like to adopt the agenda as presented. Thank you. So, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, for new members, what we'll be doing now is we're going to follow the agenda of listing of things that we have listed. Uh, you may have seen and you may not have seen it. We do have a list of items, including the one that we just uh, finished on Great Bourbon Street, and we have a number of other items that we're supporting. So that's what we'll be doing. <laughs> Next, uh, all right, we have that. Uh, while we're really changing slides and getting ready for the next uh, part of it. Um, now, what we'll do is I'll open it. Now, we have a small section right now for people who wish to comment upon the items that we have on the agenda. Are there any, anyone from the public that wishes to comment upon the items that are on the agenda? Hearing none, thank you very much. All right, so now we have that. Uh, just let me know where we can start. Okay, can we start to continue? Okay, all right, go ahead. This is like four seconds. Uh, Thanks, Carl. Just very quickly, I know some board members who have fewer had questions before this, so I just want to explain what's happening. We've done the public hearings and we've heard the presentation and from the public. Now we're going to do the land use committee meeting, for which everyone is welcome to stay. It's a public meeting. Folks that are voting on things are land use committee members. If you're a full board member, you're still welcome to weigh in, as is the public, but the voting piece, don't worry about if you're just a full board member. Right. Okay, we're going to do that if there's nothing else. There is no one else. If there's no one else to speak, we'll go into the discussion now on 280 Bourbon Street. You've heard, you know, for our committee members, you've heard the presentation. You received the information. Uh, let's just see where they uh, the comments and questions from committee from our committee members from the land Operating committee. Okay, yes, well, this is how the Okay, go ahead. Okay, so I have a couple of questions to the agenda. Um, I know that Rowana is supposed to be um, rezoned, and my question is I know that you borrow milk, but does that apply to this? With that rezoning, does it apply to because it's bordering Third Avenue? Does that apply to your presentation? And would your um, company consider rezoning to uh, an SAR, a lower SAR, which is, uh, I want to say, to uh, probably an R6, which would reduce some of the bulk because you're really not quite affordable and it is a, a rental. So, one question is would you consider reducing the R7 to R6 so you get less bulk? And does it include um, the Goanas rezoning? Well, um, no, this is our proposal does not include the Goanas rezoning, and we are not prepared to reduce the bulk to an arsenal. 
Okay. Thank you. Any other things you want to start with? We have co chair. Hello. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, I think we all agree, or I would speak for myself, that housing is critical. Absolutely. But real, true affordability is even more critical because if, you, if you're not providing real, true affordability, and I'm defining that as 30 to 40 percent, as Howard brought up, then you're building housing for people who are not in the neighborhood and can't stay here. So my question for you um, is, I'm, is twofold, well, threefold. One, will you consider Howard's question regarding affordability, and will you consider it's hard for me to understand what you're proposing when you're saying it's tied to a 421A program that expires today and hasn't been recreated yet. So I'm looking for a commitment on affordability. Second, um, I believe when I first saw this, my comment um, was that the traditional block in New York City is higher on the corners and lower in the middle. So my second question is, will you consider lower bulk in the middle of the block? And my third question is, this entire community district is in a transit zone. Why are you providing parking when, as someone has already mentioned, you're close to nine subway lines, the Long Island Railroad, and a million other public transit opportunities? So those are my three questions. Thank you. If I forget one, please correct me. It's not deliberate. Okay. okay. The last one's the easiest one. We're providing parking because the zoning resolution requires it. It's a little late for us to change the zoning resolution, so no required parking is provided. It, it requires parking and it requires 110 spaces. And yes, we're providing 15 more than we have to. I, I hear you on that. Uh, with respect to the height, the rezoning that you approved for Third Avenue allows 115 feet. It happens at Brooklyn. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me finish. If I, don't, if I don't answer your whole question, I'll go back. The zoning you approved on the corner allows 115 feet. The zoning we're proposing for this block allows 95 feet. It so happens the building that you were shown by Eric is lower than 115 feet. He's not necessarily obligated to build that building. He's not that he can build whatever he wants. I believe he intends to build what he showed you, but I'm just saying that the zoning would commit 115 feet. Okay, what was the middle question, the one with that blank one? Uh, I have a quick question. Oh, sorry. A quick question on the height. My understanding of an R7A, which is, I, I believe, what you're proposing beyond yes. the corner, yes. the maximum height is 80 or 85 feet, not 95 feet. 95 feet. I will, I, I'll okay. check it. Then I'm, uh, the last question was about true affordability, 30 okay. to 40 percent AMI. We definitely will consider what you and what Howard. Um, yeah. Can you define that a little bit more for me, please? Like, what well, are no, you we heard what you said. We heard what you said. The reason I mentioned 421 day is well, I'm telling you that there's no developer in the city who's going to build rental housing, new rental housing, without 421A. They're just not going to do it. I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you that the practicality is that the state is going to come down with something, you think, and people will match it. I just want to tell the young lady again, hold up. This part of the meeting now, well, it's only for the committee members.
Brian Fallon on the board of the committee. Uh, is that, I didn't really uh, get uh, an answer to my colleague's question. Uh, not so much that there are, you know, 50 more parking spaces than required, but why are there 50 more spaces and why didn't you ask for a waiver of the parking? I mean, the key, yes, we always ask for more affordable housing. And one of the things that drives up the cost of housing is providing parking. If we provided less parking, the building could be built for less and then more affordable units or deeper affordability could be provided. So I'm curious why more parking than is required to be built and why you didn't ask for a waiver of the parking requirement. Thank you. Go ahead. Interesting. You know, we might have done it if we knew that people would be supporting it. Not every community supports eliminating parking. Some communities never occurred to us that this community would support. Next time we'll be smarter. Um, it's, it's pretty late in the game to, to go back. We've been at this application for two and a half years. Um, it's never occurred to us. And I guess there's room for 125 spaces. So we decided we'd put 125 spaces. We hear the community suggesting we cut it to the minimum that the zoning requires. We understand that. Okay, uh, Jessica Thurston, the board secretary, uh, has a question. Hi, I'm Jessica. I can't read. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask explicitly what I didn't hear anything about your green infrastructure mm -hmm. or anything about the environment. Is there anything that you're doing to mitigate the environmental impacts of this building, such as a, God forbid, a green roof, but anything to that extent? Thanks. Hello, I'm, I'm Richard Dillon, we spoke very briefly. Uh, green infrastructure is the question. Uh, we intend to pursue a lease certification on this building. Uh, the building rule has been designed in a national sense now. Uh, we have a involved. Uh, uh, the likely uh, mechanical electrical plumbing that we can see is close to the associates. They've given us insight and advice on this project. I can't give you the details except yes, we will have a green roof, we will have a, a collection of great water or any number of those things. What, what you may find interesting is that one of the holdbacks that Nancy could give address in, in a lot of detail in the environmental is the ambient noise in the uh, and uh, uh, how and why there is so much noise. Uh, but the mitigation efforts uh, to protect the new residents from the existing noise is considerable. Uh, so there's a lot of environmental things. Uh, our, our goal and our eventual development partner's goal uh, will be to get a lease certification and to make every uh, both uh, environmentally conscious and a economically conscious set of decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Ali, go ahead. Yeah, since we were speaking about green, I have a question about the ground study. Is that required considering this plant was making chemicals? So the site is going to have an E designation. Do you know what that is? Um, it's basically a commitment to do environmental testing of the groundwater and the soils. Um, because the building is still in use and still occupied, it's not test now. But there's you cannot they cannot pull a building permit until they do the testing. Uh, that'll be reviewed by the environmental office of remediation in New York City. So they haven't done it yet, but um, they can't move forward until they do testing. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Do we have any other questions or comments from committee members or board members? One more. Okay, this is Yvette Richardson um, from our committee and board. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't here and I didn't hear the entire presentation. And I think I do remember it before. My question to you is 
do you have any plans um, or if you can reiterate for me, any plans to um, develop a local workforce and use minority businesses and women-owned businesses as part of your development? We believe that when we finish this process with the council members, that we will be called upon to make commitments in that regard. And we're prepared to make those commitments. Thank you. 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 Community board team is very excited to be here. Um, yeah, I am. Very, I'm very excited at the prospect of you know this unused warehouse turning into housing, especially in such a transit-rich uh, neighborhood where uh, the the average uh, person in that neighborhood is very wealthy and is a very desirable neighborhood for all sorts of people um, who you know maybe they live in Manhattan and they can't afford it anymore. And they are, their choices are to move into a house like this, like that's being newly built, or a house that's currently been inha being inhabited by a long-term resident. So I think that this is a very exciting development. Um, I have two questions. Will you consider uh, going down to the minimum uh, parking limit because it's so close to market center, uh, like 0.2 miles, something like that, very quick walk. Um, and I also saw in the other question I have is that I saw there is 10,000 square feet of community facilities. Um, and in the presentation, it seems like it was down to 5,000. So I'm wondering which one is, which one it is, and if uh, the school will consider reducing that further to you know, either build more housing or like to add a couple units or to lower the cost. Thank you. Everything you said was correct. Um, we had talked about putting 5,000 square feet of community facility space on the first floor and 5,000 in the cellar. We're not sure whether it makes sense to put community facility space in the cellar, given water tables. Sorry, we haven't made a final decision about that. And as far as the parking, yes, we would consider going down to the next. <clears throat> but just to be clear, in addition to the uh, Residential unit, you also have about what is it? About 10,000 for medical, uh, medical, uh, no, we just said call the community facility. We haven't the identified it. That's oh, that's the certainly certainly medical. Could be medical. Could be medical. We haven't identified it. Yeah, it's, we assume that the commercial would be 5,000 uh, years mm -hmm. on Third Avenue and then below grade space is storage and inventory space. Uh, low grade for that uh, 5,000 above grade. And we're just wondering whether the community facility is going to meet whatever the community is going to also be the low grade space given the cost of construction. I haven't made a decision about that. Okay, thank you. Um, and then, if there are no other questions, thank you, Mr. Chair. Hello, me again. Um, um, I'm just wondering about, so tonight you're asking us to vote on this, but there are a lot of unanswered questions and a lot of um, uh, strategies or questions that we're asking you to respond to. So my last question is, what kind of commitment can we get from you to continue the conversation and work together towards some of these goals like true affordability, negotiating the bulk, reducing the parking, developing green strategy, hearing a little bit more about the systems and how efficient they're going to be and all of that. We would like to keep to the schedule because we understand that you do very well from the very experience that there's the next step with the borough president who can talk about that and then there's city planning and then there's a council member. So all the things you mentioned can get resolved during the process. And I know that the board will remain active in discussions and we would cover a decision that is We'd rather not slow down the process. We've been active for two and a half years, um, and we prefer not to have anything further. We're happy to meet with you all the time. <coughs> we can and can't take. 
כן, בדרך כלל פתאום להיות איזה... אני מסתכל, יש לי אוקיי, אז אני חושב, אה, זה כזה פרט הזה, תקשיב, אז אני מיד 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 You're very active, and I would say you should apply to you see you can go okay, you can make your application with the in the book. Thank you. Okay. I'd just like to get clarification on what you said about that site. It's because in the application it did say ten thousand per square feet for a medical facility. So it's five thousand for a community space and five thousand for something else. We were talking about 10,000 for community facilities. We didn't okay. designate what type of community facilities. Okay. Community facilities include medical space, they include other types yeah. of things as well. How will you make that decision about what goes into that space, and will there be an opportunity for community input? Yes, there'll be an opportunity for community input. The, the way I've seen it work, and we have just as much experience in the community to support, and I don't see the council member tells us what they want to do. Okay. I'm just going to sum up my thoughts. I think they might reflect some others. I really would implore you all to listen very clearly to what the community board is saying. While our vote is advisory, there's clearly a lot of concern and the responses that we're getting aren't really working with us. And we need affordable housing. We need affordable housing. We need affordable housing. So. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Ms. would like to make a motion. Yes, I'm ready for a motion. I would like to vote to disapprove. Um, yes, I'm making a motion to disapprove. Since I think the bulk is too much, the affordability is not there. Um, the concern with the community board is not being met. So I would like to vote to disapprove. Second. Stop in second. Rejected your application. Uh, you can carry it out from you know from whatever has to be done on this matter. Uh, but I thank you for your presentation. <clears throat> the next item that we have is, and I'd like to try to keep this brief, uh, are the people from 581 Fulton Street here? Okay, uh, I'd like to try to keep this uh, brief because we still have other matters that we have to do. So we do uh, 589 is a presentation uh, concerning the MIH over at Flatbush and Fulton at 589 Fulton Street. Uh, we would like to get a brief uh, we like to get a brief presentation as to what your intentions are regarding 589 Fulton Street. It's also called the Brook. Mm.
What? There's no, 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 Hello. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, David Jim Showitz. And uh, first of all, apologies, I ran out over here and I just made so <laughs> I just want to explain why uh, I'm sort of got all the swing stuff in the back. Um, I'm here to introduce the project of Friday Night Open. Um, it's a, a project that's been developed by the Woodcock Group. Um, we have Scott Apple here from the Woodcock Group. Let me take out my notes so I make sure that I I catch everything, even though it's very dark. Uh, my name is Dave Chamshovich, S H A M S H O V I C H. Uh, my co op firm is Silent John PC. We work with a lot of developers.
we'll go through them in a second. So what I'd like to do today is take you a little bit to the process of what this building is going to look like. What the tenant is out, what the floor plans look like, so at least we know what's coming through the neighborhood. And give you a little bit of insight on that. And then obviously the data that you've got, we can get more into the numbers and conclusions and everything like that. So did, did you say how many stories it's going to be again? 51. To be real short with a quick hit. Um, so let's go. We got a lot of good work in this. Oh, I must ask you again, please. Yeah, but sir, he has to speak no, up. No, we don't no, want the community no, to hear because he was mumbling and I ain't hear no, real. Okay. Sir, we, we understand. But again, if you have a problem with your request, I think you have a question or comment that the whole group of schools is on the committee. You can come over and quietly say what you think or text to me. All right? But please, you can't do You can't do this. All right? That's it. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. So the site's located is a triangular site, as you see here, and you'll see it on the next slide. You can slide the whole and the flat portion of the cow, and obviously the surrounding neighborhood that you see here. And it's a it's definitely an emerging downtown Brooklyn. But in the next slide, the way we came about with the whole building design is the crossroads that you see that actually shape the site right now at the intersection of Fulton, Flashbridge, Flatbush. It's a gateway community per se, the way the whole building is being formed with the Calvin and Fulton and Flatbush, and it creates this triangular side, which really gives it a prominent space for a building. And we saw a lot of design opportunities here, right? Not just only on the scale and the geometry, but how to look at the different TV buildings that are also going in the neighborhood. So on the next one, here's the site. As I said, LB Square, right to the left here, to the west, the Calvin. Blackbush and uh, Fulton formed the site. And this is our site. And what's transpiring here is a one story building for Dalvin Square. And then our tower as a podium is going to rise one day. And the next slide how do we sculpt, for lack of a better word, this building the way it looks? Basically, it's a tower, as you see here. And the tower, then we start to play with the tower and we fix the sculpt and we pushed it back to make it more prominent. So you see how we accentuated the corner. We start to break down the scale. So it's not just a grazing tower that rises up and it starts to turn. So we actually work with the site and the skyline. And we also pushed it back and played with the articulation, the verticality of the building. So the building just doesn't rise up and actually plays with the dial and the actual position of the building. You see here the view of towers on all the sides. The Fulton Flatbush becomes a prominent corner, as we're saying. Deep Calv is actually, as we said, becoming more energized and activity. You see how it starts to shape on Flatbush and Deep Calv, and we get all the way to the right. The same thing on Fulton Street and how the tower comes back. On the next slide, how does our tower compare with other buildings? Well, obviously, nine towers going up right now. Large tower that you see there. We're right adjacent to it. You see City Point, obviously, we're in it, and Brooklyn Point as well, and how all these buildings are adjacent to it. So, we're not the tallest tower, we're not the shortest. The next one. And the character of the buildings around it and the buildings that are going on, the prominent white glass and type of material, we kind of stay away from that a little bit. You'll see that in a little while. It's a little bit exciting. Obviously, there's a lot of units, we said, 600 plus units, but the building thins up. That's what this slide shows as you get to the top. So we see light and the lamp at the top. And the next slide. So here's some statistics, right? 591 residential units. Like I said, 179 affordable units. Eight of them are inclusionary housing units. The interior amenities are approximately 20,000 square feet. Exterior amenities, 10,000, and then 56 stories building, approximately 600. So okay, then I was just not sure, but I do want to get my colleague to share the screen because I'm sure some of them questions. Sure. <clears throat> and I don't know if this is thought of my co-chair is welcome to talk. Unless you need to put it. Can you break down affordable units, please? 
referring to is the exclusionary housing and what changed at HPD was the volume of exclusionary housing. That has nothing to do with the affordable component that's tied to the fourth point of the And you issued a name, by the way? Scott Alper, the president of the recovery. Thank you. There, there are two separate programs, so I'm happy to discuss that. They're both affordable programs, they're both affordable units. There are eight units that are affordable for the inclusion of the program, and those eight plus an additional hundred and something, you know, 79 are affordable in totality. That's because they're affordable, but they're affordable under the 428 program. What you get in return the 428 program is a tax abatement. What you get in return to the inclusion housing program is a zoning bonus. Yes. Yes, because that's well, up to 130% AMI. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that they're going to go there. And I guess I don't, I don't know that we know exactly what it's going to go to because we don't know where the market rate is going to be. Mm -hmm. Versus the including housing, if those rents will get set up and sign the agreement with HPD, which will happen now. So those rents will stay the same. These numbers that I said to you, that's 1792 for two or 19 for one bedroom, 1792 for two bedroom, those numbers, assuming we sign a regular agreement in 2022 or beginning of 2023, probably 2022. Oh, I, I understand. Um, I do not have a slide. I can uh, leave you know, I can say slower. It's only three, three dollar figures. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah. Uh, if anybody wants to put up my notes, I'm happy. <laughs> I'm happy to do it. I can just read it off slower. That, that's helpful. Okay. Are there any other questions from committee members or board members? Okay, go ahead. Uh, um, I, I need to keep it. Okay. Uh, that's that's uh, that's there's a completely separate program that's a, that's a subsidy for Okay. So my question is about the difference between current AMI and future AMI. So if you're underwriting now to 130% of current AMI, can you commit not to go above 130% of today's AMI, your underwriting AMI, three years in the future? Because it seems that that might be a bit of a, it seems like you should be able to do that because it's the basis of your underwriting. And it avoids a little bit of a windfall if AMI increases. We'll discuss it on ownership side. It's not something I can commit to, to today. I mean, it's something we can discuss it on our side, but it's not. It, traditionally, that's not something that's uh, you know agreed in advance. So you know, obviously, it will depend on how the market in the next three years. So it's not something you know I'm sitting here today I can commit to. Construction, uh, we can use those numbers, those figures uh, to prepare projections of what we think things will end up in, and that, that'll be sufficient. But we don't know at the end of the day where the market's going to go up three years from now, which is why it's so difficult to commit. These nine units, though, those are going to, those are going to stick, those are going to take. Sorry, these eight units are going to stick at these MI levels. They can allow that to change um, until obviously the next the next year, and then they're rent stabilized and they increase based on either the MI or rent stabilization, depending on which is lower. Yeah. Brian, by her own, you have a question? Thank you. Um, just to make sure I understand, the the eight units are part of MIH, um, and they are you know. They are there's a few of them because that was all that um, I was required to obtain density bonus. What is the density bonus that um, is being granted uh, in exchange for those eight units? Uh, they're they're located in, in an R10 area, so you get a 3.5 zoning bonus for each square foot that you build. 
So it's based on each square foot of affordable housing that you've built. So you take those units, uh, you get their net square footage, you take a portion of the common space allocated to those units, and then you multiply by that by 3.5. So, and that's the zoning bonus. So it's really 2.5 times. Um, I, I think it's something like, is it close to 20 or 30,000 square feet? 30,000 square feet, I think. And then a portion of that is used by, uh, by the food and housing as well. Thank you. Gentlemen, uh, I would like to yeah. put that there's somebody else that wants to choose. Okay. Remember, it's 30,000 square feet from like a 630,000. Okay. Uh, so question. Okay. <laughs> That's for the two-year-old in the audience. Hi. Um, yes. So, uh, I, I again would prefer that wealthy New Yorkers who exist, I would rather them move into one of your new units than into a, a townhouse that they combine three previously affordable units and they build that to like you know eight, like I, I'd rather they move into your. Uh, one of these 591 units um, than that. But my question is about the 30,000 square feet of amenities. I'm wondering if you're open to reducing the number of luxury amenities um, and replacing them with more units uh, or generally reducing the scope of the project so that it becomes more affordable for more average New Yorkers. Amenities are going to be accessible by the affordable units. So. I, yes, but it does seem like 30,000 square feet is a lot of amenities. It's not a lot of amenities for 600 units. It's 600, it's 591 units. It's not, you know, I would agree with you. I mean, I've done 30,000 square feet amenities at 250 units. So 600 units, that's a pretty reasonable number. And that's not all interior. And that 10,000 outside it includes a pool. So a pool takes obviously a good amount of space and that's a setback anyway that wouldn't be able to be used for residential. So you're only talking about 20,000 square feet that would be interior. Right, but I'm, I'm just assuming that like the development cost for that additional, these additional units plus the pool, the maintenance. Um, I mean, I guess I'm wondering what you think your market will be for these, uh, like, yeah, so I would, yeah, the wealthy New Yorkers, um, like, is there a way to make this more appealing to middle New Yorkers who otherwise would, you know, buy up a townhouse or, you know, rent a townhouse instead of a, instead of like, instead of one of these? Um, like, is there a way to make the rent go down by spending less on maintenance and amenities? Do you see what the escalating cost of construction is in New York and the cost of labor in New York? And it's, <laughs> It's a very difficult, uh, you know, it's a very difficult, you know, um, you know, business plan to execute with anything like that. Okay. Okay. okay, go ahead. Uh, just, just to add to that additionally, you know, obviously the uh, buildings in New York have lots of amenities, and so you want to be where that market is, right? You want to you want to do what other buildings are doing to make yourself palatable, make yourself marketable. Okay, all right. Yeah, let me get, I have to move this on. Sorry, I didn't mean to draw you back in. Yeah, I gotta move this on. Go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? I'm a new, I, yeah, I'm a new board member and very new to this concept. What I don't understand is the AMI, is it? You're saying it's thirty percent, one hundred and thirty percent, and for the uh, for the uh, affordable units, they're just the affordable, affordable under the four twenty eight. So program. if this is an area, what do you use as the area? Uh, because if this is an area, okay. that I, is I, I will say at this moment, I have to cut only because we have an extensive discussion okay. on this previously, right, so and if you ever want, yes. So I might just say all of New York has the same area, <laughs> which is not exactly 100. Yeah. Of the percentage being far lower for the affordable units for um, than 130 percent of um, an area that is fairly um, high income, and that 
to make your affordable units more affordable by lowering the percentage? Uh, I'm not sure I quite follow. I'm, uh, I'm not sure I quite follow the question. That's what it is. Okay, thank you. Don't, don't forget, those units are going to be rent stabilized as well, those 100 those are my units, which is a very big advantage in terms of increasing rents over the next 30 some odd, yeah, 35 years. So that's a huge, that's a huge thing for, for tenants to have. I have another question. Another question about are you providing parking? And if so, how many? Thank the Lord. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I guess you will be in touch with us in the board office. Oh, All right, make it complete. What's the rest of the unit? And I think you have to have that as well. I think right. that was in the submission. Since this is a just a, an initial presentation, we'll give them time. This is all it is. We're not voting. I did say it earlier. There's no voting on this. That we've taken a long time. In. Now we've got to get to the items that do we will be voting on. And I thank you, gentlemen, very much. Thank, thank you for coming. Thank, thank you. you. And we'll be doing the landmark preservation commission certificate of appropriateness. Those are matters that this committee will be voting on. That's the deal. Okay. The first one is 30 Remsen Street in the Brooklyn Heights Historic District. And we start coming forward. There's work on basically windows and the facade of the four story uh, brownstone uh, that's concerned about leaks coming through the windows. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Yes, and uh, basically wanted to do, they uh, want to make a match, the new work to match the brownstone uh, that exists, and they want to make it complete, uh, look like it did at the 1930 tax photo. So do we have the presenter for 30 Remsen Street in the Brooklyn Heights Historic District? My name is Jordan White. I'm the architect on the project. Okay. Working. I, I, I assume you guys had a lot there. Okay. Yeah. There's two pages that very succinct presentation. Um, working with Jesse, like in Jonathan Siegel, the owners, um, we had previously done an interior renovation um, of the top four units of a four-story brownstone um, on Remsen Street. And um, at this stage, they're proposing to replace the existing front window unit on the building uh, facing Remsen Street um, with a proposed window system that matches as best as we can the proportions and aesthetics of the original casement window system uh, seen in the tax photo and the um, 1960s designation photo as well. Uh, we'll Have you had a chance to present to the uh, Brooklyn Heights Historic, I mean the Brooklyn Heights Association? We we did, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, they they privately reviewed the project. Um, they had a generally positive feedback. They had a question about the material, which I think we get into for today's conversation. Um, but in our discussions with Judy Stanton, um, in yes. general, I think they feel uh, supportive of the proposal um, with the approach that we're taking. Okay, thank you. That's good to know. All right, whenever, uh, let's see, we're still trying to I, get. I have a thumbs up. I, I didn't know, Taya, if you had that photograph on there. Yeah, let's do that. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to go to
<laughs> All right, at least we got it on screen. And if we can lower the lights a little bit, if possible. Um, so to, yeah, to start on the bottom of the slide, uh, just just to, to scroll down to the, the color photo of the existing condition on page one. Um, the, the existing window system, which you can see in the two, photo, two color photos at the bottom, uh, one from the interior and then from the street side at the exterior, it's obscured a little bit by the trees. Um, it's just a, a, a pretty uh, typical all window uh, glass sliding window system. It's basically a disrepair of the state. It, it leaks frequently when there's heavy rains. Um, there's a number of issues with the way that it was originally installed on glass. Um, it's been problematic since the other beginning uh, three or four years ago. Um, or first the, the, the unit three or four years ago. And the intent has always been to restore the window at some point. Uh, now that they've uh, lived in the home for a few years and experienced some of the issues that um, they've encountered with rain and just sort of uh, general weather proofing, uh, they're, they're prepared to replace that. So we've, uh, we've looked at, as we always would, the tax roll that was there at the time in the late 1930s, uh, as well as. Uh, at times designation uh, in the 1960s. And you'll see at the top uh, of, the, of the building, this casing system, which you can see in the, the tax roll there. So that's been our point of reference for the aesthetic of the kind of match in terms of uh, portions of glass to frame, operation, uh, the divided light configuration, um, and we'll see on page two uh, what the proposed solution is. We've also done some research since that window was not there. We don't know when it was removed, but at some point after the 1960s, it was removed uh, and replaced with the, the current window system that we have. Um, uh, tried to speculate about what that system may have actually looked like. So we, we worked with C. Kircher Window, um, who's um, does a lot of restoration of existing steel frame windows, um, and in some cases sal salvages steel frame windows from projects um, to try to get into the minutia of what the uh, frame dimensions may have been, what the profiles may have been, and, and use that as a, another frame of reference for the proposed window system that you see on the bottom half of the slide here. Um, so this is an elevation that shows um, a rhythm of uh, operable French casement followed by a fixed light. And then that pattern continues across the width of, of the opening that we have here. Which, based on what we think we see in the tax photo um, and the designation photo, um, seems to be what that um, configuration would look like. Um, so, here we're proposing um, an all wood window, not a steel window, which is one of the questions that, uh, that has been a question mark with our conversations with the Public Heights Association. Um, Purposely for a couple of reasons. One, it's going to be a more environmentally friendly window in terms of the production of that window compared to steel. Um, it's going to perform a little bit better in terms of thermal bridging or lack thereof. Um, but also, there's the reality of cost, uh, which is a, a, a consideration. Um, and we've, we've done pretty extensive cost comparisons with um, wood window manufacturers, with steel frame window man manufacturers, um, and in some cases, we're seeing order of magnitude of three, four, five times the price of a comparable wood window system. Um, 
and other than the steel component, the material component of, of what we're proposing, uh, we're very, very close to what we suspect would have been the uh, design aesthetic portions of, of glass to frame um, and other key components uh, to what was there in the tax level. So that, that's really been the really that focus and then trying to uh, emulate the original spirit of, of that window. Um, and we feel um, we're, we're, we're pretty happy with where we've ended, ended up in terms of, of that design. But you can see here, uh, Jesse, if you uh, scroll down a little bit, we'll see um, another section on that shows that in a little bit more detail as well. I, I, I don't know. No right there again. It, it, it is just a winter relationship. So there's no other proposed work on the side of the building. It's a multi unit co op building, um, and uh, the work would be limited to replacing the window with an existing window building. Are there any other questions from committee members or board members? Hearing none, let's go ahead. Motion to approve and to accept and second it. Are there any questions or comments upon the motion? There is none. Uh, go ahead. Uh, let's call for the vote. Brian? Yes. Esther? Esther? Yes. Carlton? Yes. Karen? Yes. Beltry? Yes. Yvette, are you here? Yes. Great. Uh, motion passes seven. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The next one uh, is 63 Avenue in the 4th Street Historic District. Uh, 66. Is it 66? 66. 66. Oh, yeah. I moved to 66 uh, in the southwest. Okay, and we'll be doing work. And I think, although light, I'm trying to read with bad light, but it looks like we're doing work on a full rig, rear yard extension. Uh, the work that's going on the pool that's going on the floor. Yeah. And it will be 14 feet. I'm trying to read the rest of my notes, but I can barely make it on. Okay. No, 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 that's a pull up. So, all right, so uh, that's a pull up. Yes, yes. Well, no, we want to put it on there. That's the, uh, that's the, okay. So, the Fourth Street Association, the, uh, the, the, the Society for the Society for the Preservation of Fort My name is Lisa Easton, and Mariana Avila Flynn is running slides and work with Easton Architects for the Architects for the Cash. Okay. So, yeah, yes, <laughs> I'm sorry, but this is uh... just to give you a little background on the project. So, the owner of 66 Green uh, came to us about 12 years ago, I'd say. To do the exterior restoration on the front of her facade, which we did uh, to receive a loan from the Landmarks Conservancy to do the work. Um, at that time, she said, Oh, you know, I'd really like to do an addition somewhere down the line. Um, as she gets older, she would like to stay in the house uh, till the end. And so the real purpose for this addition is to enclose the stair that goes to the basement. So she can use the utilities and sewers without having to go outside to the backyard. To her tenant's apartment to get into the basement. So that's really the impetus for this. So she's back to us, well, plus, plus or minus 12 years later, uh, to do a rear yard addition. So this is uh, the front of her house at 66 Green. Next slide. And just to give you a sense of the block portion of it, a little bit more than 50% of it is in the Fort Green Historic District, which is the shaded gray area to the right in the top part of the block. The 
right outside of the red boundary, you see that in the history. So for the first point of departure, you were looking at the block complexity, and more than 50% of the block has already had a distribution. So the reason we are here is because we're triggering um, the public hearing process for visibility. So you will see this addition from Claremont Street, which is to the east of our property. And so if you this, can walk up to the exit point. Sure, I'm sorry. It's the dark lot. 66, 66 Green is the dark lot at the very that's top of the block. The that's black is the black. Yep, yep, that's the very top. Okay. And then we've color coded the different heights of these two rear yard additions. That's what you see in the orange color transition. Next slide. So looking at 66 Green's Green Avenue case, uh, there are 10 lots. And of those 10 lots, five of them have new yard additions already. So looking at them, they range in, in dimension from 28 feet uh, to as small as six feet. And so our proposed extension is 14 feet into the rear yard, which you see in that dashed red uh, rectangle. And then we've created an elevation in the rear to show you the gray volumes are the additions to the block already. So these are the rear yard additions. And this is how our proposed addition. So just to give you a sense of the plan, there's about 140 square feet that we're adding to the cellar, which you see on the left, to give that stair access down. Then at the garden level, we're adding the extension of about 300 square feet, um, which will be part of the bedroom and the apartment that's at the garden level. And then on the parlor level, we're extending the kitchen by that 14 feet to allow for the stair to pass through and give the visible space in the kitchen. Next slide. So here's the existing on the left and the proposed on the right. So we're really flipping the stair and putting it internal to the kitchen. So it's two stories strong. And then here's looking at it from the rear yard back. You will see what that addition looks like. Oops. And then here's the existing on the left. So you see the iron stair that takes you from the parlor level down to the garden. And then there's a build up hatch that takes you to the cellar. And on the right is the proposed addition. So this is the visibility from Claremont. So this is the existing visibility. So we're showing, it's hard to see on the slide, but there's a red line pointing to the white building that is 66 green. So this is without an addition, this is the existing condition. So you see there is there is visibility, there is some buffer to that visibility in terms of foliage and other additions. And then the next slide will render what we propose to be a vision. So what you're seeing from the visibility perspective is the brick wall, the character wall. You'll never see the actual rear yard addition uh, face of it, I should say. You're just seeing masonry. So when we chose our materials, we thought to respond to the context of the block, it was appropriate to use red brick as the exposed case. And then the rendering that we showed earlier, and it's an enlarged here, this back face facing the rear yard would be painted wood. So we're using masonry for the exposed face, and then the painted wood would only be seen by neighbors in the block looking back at, at 66 feet. And then you can see contextual photos of the variety of, dish, of additions on the block and the view from 66 green, which is along the lower slide. All those three are views from the staircase or the current condition of 66 green looking at the neighbors. So it is a variety of, of shapes and sizes and scale. And then these were just uh, expanded for clarity sake of what the addition, the space, the actual space that would be given. But really we wanted to concentrate on the, the perspective of the brick wall, I think is really what we want to have in the plan to accommodate that. Okay, I'm finished yet. Could you go back to the existing condition quickly and then pull over it again, please? So actually what caught my attention was um, you know, you you have been saying contextually you're you're going for the red brick on the exposed face. That face is quite visible. And to me, actually, the materiality is not red brick there. Um, 
if you go back one slide, you've got all this sort of light colored stuff right underneath this, whatever the finishes are for the back to standard back of the house. So what you're proposing is actually you're bringing a front facing material to the backyard. I don't know that actually that's what I would agree with, because if you go forward again, it really it, it um, is a contrast to your neighbor, which is a white face, rear yard facing a facade. So are you open to considering a different material? Or oh, no, absolutely. We actually rendered it in stucco. We did both, and we actually presented it in our preliminary meeting with landmarks. Oh, and we all came back to the fact that in the foreground you see red, and the rest of the stucco does sort of perpetuate itself mid-block. But the, it just to us looked better in red brick, but of course we're open to the stucco. We have the, we have the rendering anyway. It yeah, just jumps out more. Yeah. It jumps out more as white behind the trees. <laughs> I defer to landmarks, but I just wanted to raise that question. Sure. Excuse me? Yes, we do. In the preliminary review, yes. The, you know, the staff level of deputy commissioner. Questions or comments? I mean, wants to make a motion. Just you may find of interest, uh, 225 uh, Skimmerhorn Street has now been sold for $142 million. Um, I think it's what I'm trying to remember the name of it as well. I can't see it on my notes here, but again, that's the $142 million. Uh, and which is not quite news, but I still brought it open the show. Uh, uh, no, this is a uh, just an article on in Black Earth Peace Sunday's Daily News about the high rent, and they show a picture. If you can't see from here, uh, we're walking toward Green Street. And the town of yeah. I don't know if there's a specific, you know, but you can certainly know what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's the, uh, those, uh, just to mention also, I use Google Maps as well as use Google Maps to find things. Uh, just, just a little thing of interest was that Google Maps for one day changed the name of Bedford Avenue to Maple Avenue. Why and how, we don't know, but that's what happened. <laughs> they changed the name of Bedford Avenue to, to Maple Avenue. Yes, okay. All right. Next. All right. <laughs> Maybe that's what happened. We'll tell you. Computer screw up. Okay. Computer screw up. Okay. Next, uh, we have the open session. Uh, okay, ma'am, I will give you two minutes. You've been wanting to speak. This is your turn, but you have two minutes to fight. And I will. I'll be running to my party tonight. Okay. So, I'll be looking at Joseph Tiffany environment. Meantime, we're going to 589 Fulton Street. You know, that's the point where people can probably get mad. You know, most of the time, I don't know. Okay. We're going to see some 
that, from the moment he's on that spot, which is the first piece of that, he falls on out of 7 11. He sits at the bottom, he still goes to the seat, he puts up the sunlight, right? He goes up at the top, he can go seat no longer. Right? He sits at the bottom, and that's the first one of the bottom. You know what else? Some people die, some people got sick. Um, some got sick. 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 Some Also, who both of the and both of the The key might go to the most that take over the other law of love, the best transportation law. So, we got to consider the whole thing, not just one thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Next on our list is uh, other business, which I mean, actually, let's quickly turn it over. Hey, um, I'm not as eloquent as my predecessor. Uh, my name's Dan. I live in Dumbo. Um, I had a really random question, which is Washington Street right now is seven days a week open to rent. Um, currently, Main Street is under construction every day of the week. So the open street is prohibiting traffic going through. Um, I think it's a Department of Transportation, but I wanted to bring it to the committee as well. Um, there's double parking, it's a huge safety issue. Um, I just wanted to see if there was a way to revise that down to even the weekends to consider the five, you know, two days a week rather than seven days a week. Um, I just didn't know how to raise that. Uh, yeah, you're, we have a committee <clears throat> for transportation, public safety. Uh, I don't know when the next. Is it tomorrow? I think you're right. It's tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. tomorrow it's going to be on YouTube. Yeah. yeah. So, are you, all right. So, if you look at our, look at our car. Yeah. Okay. 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 This is. Okay. So, now our uh, open session, we'll turn it over to our district, uh, active district manager, Tammy. I'm not the active district manager. Um, this is a great opportunity to mention um, we didn't want to make a public announcement until after this meeting to avoid any confusion. Um, the governor's executive order allows us to meet remotely was extended late yesterday. It's too late <laughs> to change course for tonight. However, tomorrow's transportation and public safety meeting will be on Zoom. Oh, yeah. it, it's actually through July 14th. For one full month. You, you, got, you got to take it up with the governor. Yeah. I have two things. One is our committee. We need to work on our special district needs assessment. Um, our budget and capital and ex expense requests. I have only put one item in, but I know it takes time to think about this. And so we aren't meeting for the next two months. That's our homework, okay? Please, it's only as good as what we put into it. And okay, some of the stuff doesn't get funded, but they do have to respond to our requests. So Tay is cheering us on and we can commit to that, right? Everyone? Um, the second thing is just quickly that I wanted to mention that um, Mr. Pinole, who's not here, and I are still working on the AMI white paper. I made some progress on it, but it wasn't ready to share in the committee. Um, she's not here anymore, but if anybody has questions about AMI, in the meantime, you're welcome to reach out to me directly. But what we're trying to do is to put together a position paper that we could stand behind and ask our electeds and other community partners to support. So if you have any thoughts about that or you want to get involved, please let me know. Thank you. I 
came in today. You can make it, you can apply to the board to, yes, do you want to make it? Yes, you want to really participate. And you have, you want to tell us everything you want to do, make your application to the board office that you want to be considered a member of the board. Uh, you can also ask it to the board office. The yeah. yeah. website, and you, and you, can, you can approach the Mueller if you get the chance. If you have, a, you have an email address, you have an email address. I can't add a you can be a chance. You can't add a chance. You can't add a Come back. We haven't adjourned yet. Please come back. We have a motion. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Second. All right. Thank you. Thank you for coming.